Bring your microphone with you if you would. <laughs> I want to take this time to thank both Pastor Brad and Linda, all the ladies who went on our trip to Allenburg, all 10 of us, and they appointed me spokesperson, so here I am. <laughs> uh, this trip was absolutely incredible. God worked through Pastor Brad and Linda, and we were shown Jesus' love and care and affection. They, they absolutely, all the ladies just cannot express their thanks to you both for memories that will will all of our lives. We wanted to do something really special for you too, and this is what we decided to do. So for you and for that, from our hearts, we thank you and we praise God for you and just bless you. <laughs> this, is, this is not why we did that. This is not why we did that. We, we just so wanted to love on the ladies. We just wanted to... Mm, we wanted you to feel special. That's that's why we did it. How we can love on you. Well, thank you guys so much. We had the best time. Just the best time. I learned things about these ladies. I just learned about life and getting older. I learned it. and we've got memories that are gonna last us a lot lifetime too. And we actually would do it again. So <laughs> They, uh, they've already asked us to do it again. <laughs> so it's, but it was kind of like going through vacation Bible school, you know? You're in the midst of vacation Bible school, you do not ask somebody to do vacation Bible school next week. <laughs> it's just one, not the best timing. Uh, so driving back, uh, driving back from Gatlinburg in about the uh, eighth or ninth or tenth hour behind the wheel uh, was maybe not the best time to be able to say, "Let's do it again." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, yes, we have uh, we have come to the uh, to a great appreciation uh, and would love to be able to do that again in the days to come. All right, thank you so much, ladies. All right, another word of praise this morning. Marlene. Praise God. My daughter came through her surgery just fine. Wonderful. So she's on her way to recovery. Thanks to the good Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord for a daughter who's come through surgery and is doing great. Vivian. Yeah, and I want to praise for our Roger and Janet and the uh, youth group that came and helped us get some grass seed and straw sprinkled around all over our backyard to have something finally done, done, that part. <laughs> it's all in God's hands, but it's all always been in God's hands. And I'm, I'm just glad the kids worked hard and they did a great job. Oh, great, great. Second time they've been over there, right? Absolutely. That's wonderful. Thank you, Roger and Janet, uh, for leading that. Yes, Cindy. This week we had fog, pretty thick fog, several days.
went to work that morning and just felt like God had just given me my own personal help. Yeah. It was just amazing. I just praise him for that. And so the next time you see fog and you don't like it, you just think about that. That's right. <laughs> praise God for the fog. Yes, that's right. All right. Thanks for sharing. All right. Somebody else? Yes. I have CAT scan done this past week to see if I had a stroke. And I did not have a stroke. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. <laughs> we rejoice with you, Bula. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, lift our voices in prayer uh, to the Lord this morning as we begin. Father, I thank you for this body of believers who I get the privilege of being with for all eternity. We will, we will sing and we will dance. And we will be in your presence and our worship will be as though we have never worshiped here on earth before because it will be perfect in heaven. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the hope of that, but I thank you for the practice that we get today to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth for that's the kind of worshipers that our Lord desires. And so I uh, come to you today with just a resounding thank you for all the praises that are here. Thank you for the medical reports that have been, that have been answered. And uh, Lord, far beyond what we could have even asked. And Father, I thank you for uh, a time with uh, ladies and I just look forward to uh, uh, being able to even share a little bit more about uh, the greatness of you to us while we were there. Lord, uh, today we, uh, we lift our voices to you in praise we sing to your holy name. We will gather tonight at uh, Ray and Joan's house and, and sing songs to you and praises to you as well, for you're worthy. And we uh, ask, Lord, that now, as we receive these tithes and offerings to advance your kingdom here upon the earth, that, Lord, you would use them for your glory and your name's sake. In Christ's name I pray these things. Amen.
Sometimes life throws you curveballs, and this year has been a, a year of curveballs for me, and I'm sure many of you can attest to the same that life throws you curveballs. But I'm glad that when we are weak, that we know the one who is strong and can carry us through those times. I asked Femi to help me sing this morning.
If you have your scripture, turn with me, if you would, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. The message and I, I have entitled, When You Feel All Alone. Jim, I'm going to throw you a curveball. Okay. I asked Chris to be able to show me a picture of the sign out front. You got it. All right. Look at that. Isn't that great? <clears throat> Thank you, Brother John and the, and the trustees uh, for all the work that they've done to, to get that up. It looks great. We'll have some shrubbery uh, or something around it to be able to cover up an uh, electrical line there. But beautiful sign. And you'll have to come by at night sometime to be able to see it illuminated. And uh, it's, it's beautiful. So uh, praise the Lord for a completed project. Now, uh, Brother John wants me to let you know before you start digging out there in front, you need to see him. Uh, let him know because you might find it a shocking experience. <laughs> we have a, uh, a story today, not a, not a PowerPoint, uh, but just three simple points that you can remember. Jesus sees, Jesus speaks, and Jesus saves. Those three simple points come out of this one small section of scripture in which we have a funeral that Jesus walks upon and then when he is there, things begin to change. Someone in, entitled this passage, a funny thing happened on the way to the cemetery. I remember a funny thing happened on the way to the cemetery once. Linda and I were, were in a cemetery procession and I was, I was preaching that message uh, and that service and we left the funeral home, we went to the cemetery and it was Bud Kaiser and we had Doris with us um, as we were driving and, and so we were over in an area of Akron following uh, the, uh, the hearst with her husband there in it and the funeral director did not know where he was really going. So we went to the wrong funeral home, or the wrong cemetery, rather. So he pulls in, and, he, uh, and he's looking around. He, he finds, finds somebody, and he asks them where, where uh, to go. And he finds out that he's in the wrong cemetery. And so we, uh, he tells us where it's at, and he tells the funeral director where it's at. So he gets back in the hearse and starts driving again. And Doris doesn't miss a beat. You know, here is someone who's just lost her husband, but her, her mind at that moment was, Bud always liked to go on a drive. <laughs> and he is going to get one last drive up here in Akron before we lay him down. It was such a great way to be able to see it. I mean, she had peace to know where he really was. And what a... Uh, what a wonderful memory that I have of that moment. When Jesus comes upon the scene, funny things begin to happen. The impossible becomes possible. Tears turn into shouts of joy. And sorrow gives way to praise. D.O. Moody says, Jesus spoiled every single funeral he ever went to. Mark Lowry said this, Jesus never preached a funeral. He raised the dead. And when he raised the dead, the funeral's over. <laughs> so here in this passage, we're going to see a, a widow who has another death in the family. It's her son. Probably in that feeling of being all alone, even in the midst of a crowd that's around her, wondering what's going to happen. Jesus comes on the scene. Things change rather rapidly. So stand with me if you would as we honor the reading of God's holy word. We'll begin reading chapter 7, the Gospel of Luke, verse 11. Soon afterward, and that is after he left a centurion in Capernaum, Jesus went to the town of Nain 
And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. And as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. And then he went up and he touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. And they were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. You may be seated. Three points, Jesus sees, Jesus speaks, and Jesus saves. Jesus sees. Let me point a, or paint a big picture for you. There are two crowds, this scripture says. There is the crowd that's with Jesus that is coming into the city by the gate. That crowd is probably joyous. They have been with Jesus up on the mount up to his teaching. They have been with him as he has healed this centurion's servant. There are probably smiles abounding. And there's another crowd. The passage tells us there is a crowd that's with the woman in a funeral possession. And if you would, let me describe, if I could, how that crowd looked. It was probably full of mourners. They often paid to have people come and mourn and would wail out and cry out. Usually the, the deceased, in this case, the deceased mom, would be in the front of the possession. And then the coffin in this case, as it's in the New International Version, it was actually more of a, of a gurney, more of a stretcher that was being carried. It was open. You could actually see the body. It doesn't have it closed on the top. It is open. And so as they are walking along, the mom is in the front, probably dressed in a, in a torn clothes because she is in grief. And then as she is going, the crowd is behind her with her son's body. Life in one group and death in another group. And they're about to come in contact with one another. Life in Jesus is because he is seeing the situation. And it says not only does he see, but he says... He saw her and his heart went out to her. We said last week that describes compassion. It is not just seeing a need. It is not just pity that feels sorrow for a person in a situation, in some kind of, of trial in their life. But compassion not only sees it, but does something about it. And Jesus is doing something about it. Let me ask you, when was the last time your heart went out to someone like Jesus' heart went out to someone? When did you see someone in need as Jesus did and act as Jesus did? When we are most like Jesus, we are looking at the scripture to see what he would do and then imitating his actions, his way of living and he sees this woman and she has a sad past she is a widow this is not the first time she's been through a funeral her husband has died she has been through a more mourning mourning of a funeral before she knows what it means to be alone without a husband and even in the present, the present is not good because now her dead son is being carried out. 
It's another season of trial in her life. It's another time when she is about to face, come face to face with death. And her future is not good either. Because this was her only son. Possibly the only source of financial income that would help in paying for a way going forward. To be in Jesus' time and to be a widow was a terrible plight. They did not have government assistance. They did not have a retirement that you drew upon. You were often at the mercy of a family and upon those who would give. But Jesus saw her. Can I tell you that he still sees today? He still sees you in your place. He still is one who looks down upon you and shows you compassion. There was once a little girl whose mom, in the very early age of this little girl's life, went to the hospital, and it happened to be the first time that she would spend the night alone with her dad. And it came time to go to bed, and the dad turned off the light. And the little girl asked, Quietly, Daddy, are you there? And he said, yes. And a moment later, she asked, Daddy, are you looking at me? And he said, yes. And in just a few moments, she fell off to sleep. Can I assure you that your Father in heaven sees you as well? He knows your situation. He knows what's going on in your life. Someone once said, God loves every one of us as if there but were one of us. He loves every one of us as if we are the only one. That's how God sees us. And then he speaks. It says, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. You see, when Jesus was saying, don't cry, it was not as if he was saying, don't cry. It's not going to do you any good to cry. You're not going to change anything by crying, so don't cry. That's not what he was saying. I sometimes say that in my household. Something happened and there's a lot of regret that happens and I will, I will turn that way and I will say, it really doesn't do any good. You can't change what has already happened. So let's not get upset about something that we can't change. That's not what Jesus was doing. Jesus was saying to her, I know what's coming. You don't have to cry. You see, Jesus knew this situation before he came to this situation. It was not as though he was walking into the city of Nain. On accident, he runs up on a funeral. No. God does nothing by happenstance. He had left Capernaum. He is coming to Nain about 20 miles away, and he came there on purpose. And his purpose was to meet a widow in a funeral possession and to bring back her son so that you and I could learn from it today. And that he could be seen for who he was. He could see the situation ahead of time and to be able to see here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to provide for you. She just doesn't know. So he said, don't cry. Don't cry. We were in Gatlinburg with the ladies, and I tell you what, we had prayed that God would just lavish his love upon these ladies. That he would just lavish down his love. The scripture says that he lavishes us with love. We just wanted to be able to see that in this trip. And he did not disappoint. It was as if different times of the trip, you would just be able to see the handiwork of God moving in things. One of them was, we got to see two of our own people in Gatlinburg, 
Actually, it was in Pigeon Forge. Have you ever been there between Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge? They're two pretty good sized towns. We ran into Ron and Joanna Bowman on the sidewalk. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It was, such a, it was such a blessing. Our people loved it. We got to get a picture with them on, on a, just on, on a place overlooking the river. It was wonderful. And I'll show you some of the pictures. Joanne, she, she is something. She, I pulled the bus around. She comes running out and she's pointing towards it. Get my picture. Look, the bus is here. It was fun. And then you go to Gatlinburg. The one thing that you want to do when you go to the Smoky Mountains is to see a bear, right? You want to see a bear. Everybody that drives in the mountains wants to see a bear. We were driving through Cades Cove in the evening driving through we saw some turkeys at the welcome station right at the beginning we thought this is going to be a good day so uh, and we saw some wild horses or some tame horses we saw a bunch of horses we tried to count everything we saw we got down to counting birds and butterflies uh, that we saw but we were wanting to see a bear so we're driving through and on the back side on the way out it's 11 mile oval we hear from the back D say, I see a bear. And it was just no bear, it was a bear. I mean, it was a big bear, and it was probably as close as to, I don't know, I don't know, here to the back wall, here to the other wall. We were inside a, a pretty, pretty nice bus, it wasn't gonna get us, but it was a really nice looking bear, okay? It was the closest I've ever been to a bear in the wild. And uh, it was just as though God had said, here, let me share it with this bear. He's going to come right by your bus, and you're going to be able to see him. I don't know that everybody got as excited as Linda did, but uh, <coughs> it, was, uh, it was really cool to be able to see a bear. One other thing, you know, this is really odd. We got to see, we got to see Ellie's brother, Josh. He comes here sometimes. Uh, he lives over in Pennsylvania. He happened to be in, in um, Gatlinburg at the same time, and we got to see him while we were there. He came by the convention while we were there, and we got to see him at the time when we were leaving. He came to the same place where we were at, and we got to see each other. We say goodbye. He came on the bus and said goodbye to everybody. So we're, uh, we're driving down the road. Four and a half hours later, we'd stopped and got some gas, we got a little bit to eat, used the restroom. Four and a half hours later, we're in a traffic stop. All three lanes come down to one lane, okay? Stopped, we're stopped in traffic. I look out the front and somebody in the truck in front of us is waving at us. <laughs> Guess who it was? It was Josh. <laughs> Thousands of cars we passed. Thousands of cars go zipping by us all over the place, and there's one vehicle in front of us, and a guy's waving his arm, and it's Josh. How could that happen? How could that happen? What's the likelihood of that happening? That is amazing, because God speaks, and it happens. You see, I asked myself this question when I was thinking about this woman, how did Jesus know that she was a widow? How did he know that her son was the one who was behind her on the coffin or gurney or the stretcher or whatever you would like to say? How did he know it was her only son? How did he know the situation of this woman's life. Well, can I tell you that God never acts without a fixed goal and a fixed purpose in mind? There are no unexpected coincidences in God's life. There are no plan Bs. Everything within the plan of God is unchanging and everything comes to pass. He is indeed sovereign over all. You might think, well, you were lucky going through Gatlinburg and seeing a bear. I was not lucky. I had a God who had a bear, and the bear came right by our bus. Oh, we got to see a coyote, too. That was kind of cool. 
See, God told his people Israel in Jeremiah 29 and 11, I know the thoughts I have for you. In other words, there are no random thoughts in God's minds. Nothing pops into God's mind. Nothing pops out of God's mind. He doesn't have to remember anything, and he doesn't ever forget anything either. Isaiah 55, 11 says, My word which goes forth from my mouth will not return to me void. In, in other words, it won't return empty. It will accomplish everything that I have desired it for to, to be accomplished. Every word is intentional. Every word affects its goal. And so when the Lord came and he meets this funeral possession, I believe it was with the intent of God who had him had him leave as a plan from Capernaum to go 20 miles down to Nain. Let me tell you a little bit about Nain. Nobody probably would have wanted to go to Nain. There's only 200 people there. Everybody knew everybody in Nain. That's why it's so astonishing when he finds out what happens at the end. Everybody in town is going to know about it. But when he gets there and he sees this, I believe it was a divine appointment for this woman and a divine appointment for her son and a divine appointment for everyone who would look upon this passage for what it really is. Is Jesus that not just sees and not just speaks, but it is Jesus who saves. And he says, then he went up and he touched the gurney or the stretcher and those carrying it stood still. What authority. They stop. And he says, young man, I say to you, arise. Now, catch this picture. It would be like you going to a funeral home and a visitation, and you come by the casket who is there, and you say, my son, I tell you, Arise. I bet people's ears were going, what did he just say? That is such a strange thing to say. Why would he say that until they saw him set up? Wow. What a moment that must have been. There must have been people who were saying at that moment, I can't believe this. What are we seeing? What is going on? What a change his life would happen by just the words of Jesus. In one minute, he's cold, helpless, silent, and now he's a glow and warmth of new life. And he's able to testify by speaking of his resurrection from the dead. Arise. A caring and thoughtful part is, is that the scripture says the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. That is compassion, is it not? That is a God who is looking down on a situation and saying, you do not need to cry because I have seen this way before it's going to happen and it is going to change your life and change his. Can I tell you also that God not only sees, but he speaks into your life as well? He speaks into your life and he will save you from the situation where you're in. Some have to deal with loneliness. Some are married and have family and still are lonely. Some are by themselves. 
And Jesus is willing to be able to speak into your life and be able to change the situations of your life. In fact, I would say to you in the days ahead, if you feel lonely, if you feel alone, come back to Luke chapter 7 and read this account of a widow. Come back and see a Christ who has come that this might be changed in her life and desires that same change in yours. I wonder what the boy said when he sat up. Did he say, where am I? What's going on? Why are all these people here? Mom, why are you so upset? Maybe he said, I'm hungry. I want something to eat. Alone? No. Not if you're a Christian. Because Jesus said, I'm going away. And it's a good thing that I go away. Because when I go away, I'm going to send the Spirit. And the Spirit is going to minister in my name. And the Spirit is going to be with you. And in fact, the Spirit is going to be in you. So if you're here today and you're a Christian, you're never really, truly alone. Seek Him. Call out to Him. What happened to this young man is a living illustration of what has happened to a person who has become a Christian, who has been converted to Christ. Because for those who are in Christ, we also were once dead. Turn with me, if you would, to over just a few books to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, speaking to the church at Ephesus, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit that is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the, the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Verse 4, but God, who is rich, who is great in love for us, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace that you have been saved. God's unmerited favor gives us hope. God's grace to this woman was not because of this woman's situation. She did nothing to merit the miracle that had come into her life. That's why it is grace. She did not even ask the Lord to do it, did she? There's no trace that she has even put her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He just came to her in her moment of need and brings in life and raises her son from the dead. Jesus didn't say, what a good-looking look young man he was. In fact, he is a good-looking dead young man. He didn't say, that's a pretty nice-looking corpse. Dressed all up, looks pretty nice. I think I'm going to raise him from the dead. No, this miracle was done totally by God's great compassion and love. It was all about grace from beginning to the end. The message of grace brings us hope even in this passage. When you and I were dead in our trespasses and sins, God's grace has come to us. He has reached out as if it were literal and touched us in our dead position. He touched us when we were laying spiritually dead and he said, arise. 
and we arose. And once we were dead, and now we're alive in him. It was totally his grace. It does not depend at all upon what we as sinners do. Thus, it brings hope to those who are hopeless. The gospel is all about grace. It is not about works. It's not a try a little harder, clean up your life, do these works, and you will receive God's salvation. No, it is trust and believe, turn to me, and you will find eternal rest for your soul. It's kind of a dual picture, if you would see it in the way it is. One picture is for us to be able to see as Jesus did, not in its totality because we can't see what's coming up ahead. But you know, as you and I walk through this life, we see opportunities for us to be able to make a difference in someone's life. We see an opportunity to have compassion upon somebody, and it's God's invitation for us to come and to be his hands and his feet. You see, Jesus is no longer here walking around the world as we are. He has left that for us. He has left us to be the people whose hands reach out to those who are hurting, to reach out to those who are lonely, to make a call to a widow, to stop by their house, to take over dinner, to be someone who is there providing for them a little bit of help. I'll ask again. When was the last time you saw someone as Jesus did and your heart went out to them and your compassion went from seeing to action? Second part of this picture is this is a picture of what God has spiritually done or is willing to do to those who would come to him. He never says to us, clean up your life and I will lift you up and make you alive spiritually. But he does say this, when I come to you, will you receive me? Will you receive me as your Lord? Will you receive me as your Savior? Will you put your trust in me? I think D.L. Moody was right. Jesus never was a part of a funeral. He didn't mess up. He messed it up. And I'm so glad he did. Because in doing so, we have an illustration of a Lord that is able to bring us the hope that we need, the hope that we have, and it's always in him. It's always in his church, which is the hands and the